Avinu Malkenu, Father, our King, we thank you so much for this evening. Thank you, Father, for all those who are part of this study, who are part of uh, uh, midweek uh, teachings, Lord, and, and all those who desire to continue to grow in their faith. And Lord, I thank you, Father, for all those who are faithful in the midst of Beth Yeshua. We are just so grateful for everybody, Lord, that you have brought to us, and thank you for all that you're doing. Lord, we give you glory and praise as we study your word tonight. We thank you for this past week uh, with the prophetic conference, Lord. We thank you for all that you're doing in individuals' lives. And we just, we are so excited to see what you have in store for us. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. All right, so the first place I want to go is to understand is let's go to um, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. Everybody knows this passage, but I just, we want to talk a little bit about it first. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. So this is what the office of an evangelist is, okay? Now, some people try to say, well, there's no such thing. There, there really is. It's like, it's like this. A mom has a pastoral heart, but is a mom called to be in a pastor? See what I'm saying? My mom has a very prophetic gift, but is she called to be a prophet? Right? And it's one of those things. So is, some people are actually called to the office of an evangelist, just like I'm called to the office of being a pastor. And because I walk as a pastor slash teacher, and those are my two main gifts, okay, I will oftentimes walk too strongly in my pastoral gift, which could be also a negative. Being a negative in my pastoral gift is I don't want to see people, I don't want to confront people with, with their sins in their lives. Or, you know, I don't see things so black and white in their lives. I don't want to, I don't want to kind of throw a bomb in the nest egg, and so to, so to speak, if not the nest egg, the the uh, the uh, the nest, <laughs> the nest. I don't want to upset um, people's lives when I can. When I like, let's say there's couples living together, you know, I want to love on them and I want to minister to them and I want to speak into their lives. But sometimes it's hard because of being a pastor. If I don't, even though I love them and I know that love sometimes is discipline as well. I don't want to tell them, hey, you know, you guys plan on getting married here because I can't have you guys live together here if you're part of Beth Yeshua. And if I'm if if you call me to be your rabbi or your pastor, I really need to speak into this in your life and ask you to stop stop living together and step out of that. That's my pastoral heart. I don't want to kind of uh, you know hurt that. But my teaching spirit, my teaching gift comes out and it's like, listen, we got to do this. And then also I have a very prophetic gift in my life as well. So the prophet wants to come out and say, hey. Clean this act up and get the heart, heart. You know what I mean? It's like, so we got to learn how to balance these things in our lives a lot of times. And so sometimes we have to recognize our strengths can times at times be our weakness. And so we want to look at that. So even though mothers and other people are called, like, I think mothers have a tremendous pastoral gift. I think just naturally being a mother makes you a pastor because you have to you you have this love for your children, but being a father makes you a pastor as well. But that doesn't necessarily mean you're called into the office of a pastor, right? Just like you're not, a father's not called into the office of a mother. He could fill the role at times of being that nurturing person for his children, especially if the mother isn't around, and vice versa. But it doesn't make him a, a, a mother. He's still a father. So, so we have to understand these terms biblically as well for us to move and to operate in marketplace evangelism. So those of you that are just joining us, like I told you, you can take, you can, if you're making notes, you can just title tonight called marketplace evangelism. Okay. So Ephesians chapter four, verse 11, it says he, and it actually right here, it's talking about, um, uh, Yeshua, actually, if you look at this whole process here, uh, the Lord, and then we get to here, but it, we also see here it's God. He himself, in, in Ephesians is chapter 4, it's God, and in Corinthians, it's, it's Yeshua. But it says here, he himself gave some to be emissaries or apostles, some as prophets, some as proclaimers of the good news. And that's what really the term evangelist or evangelistus is the Greek word. You, it's actually, it's kind of, it's wild to pronounce, but it's 
yogan, yogangelistes. Yogangelistes is the Greek word for an evangelist. So proclaimers of the good news. So if you want a, a, a an exact uh, definition of that word, that's what it means, is to be a proclaimer of the good news. And some as shepherds or pastors, roim is the Hebrew word, and teachers. And watch what it says here in verse 12. So this is the most important part here. To equip. To equip means to train up. It means to give the tools. If I was to if if I was going to a college to learn how to do auto mechanics, they're going to equip me, okay, with the proper tools to do mechanical work on vehicles. Okay. So it's the same kind of thing, regardless of what what education background you have. Um, for instance, you know, uh, let's take Mona for for example. Your Mona does bookkeeping. Well, it'd be hard for her to do bookkeeping if she didn't have a program to keep books. <laughs> okay, now let's go even farther back. Before the programs, if you didn't know how to add and subtract and use a calculator or count your fingers and your toes, it's really hard to do bookkeeping if you can't even go all the way back that. What was that thing that they used to use? Abacus. 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 There, yeah. <laughs> even that, okay? So you have to have the proper tools to do the job that that you're called to do. So so when you see this here it says that God himself gave these gifts to some for the equipping of the saints to do the work of the ministry. So if you look at it verse 12 to equip the kedoshim, the holy ones, which in which is all of us, um for the work of service, for building up the body of Messiah. And it says this will continue until we come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Ben Elohim to mature adulthood, to the measure of the stat stature of Messiah's fullness. Okay, so this will continue on, and we obviously see evangelists in the Book of Acts. We see it in throughout throughout that were about far and beyond the apostles. You know, there's some thought out there that apostles were at one point, and then the apostles ran out, and that gift is no longer there. I think that that gift still operates through people. I think that that gift still operates through the body of believers, for sure. Um, obviously, we only have 12 apostles that were the original apostles, the emissaries. But we see, we definitely see people move in the gift of uh, apostleship. And we definitely see the office of apostle uh, operate within the within denominations and within within the body of Messiah today all around. So there is still that office, I think, that is still out there. Um, and we can get into an argument on that on saying, well, you know, whether or not it was just the 12 and then they had to appoint someone else um, and they all had to be witnesses. That's what some people argue. They all had to be witnesses of Yeshua's death and resurrection and be part of his ministry to be called an apostle. That's all here and here and there. I mean, how's the saying go? Neither here nor there type of thing. Um, the, the point that we're looking at tonight is evangelism. And the office of evangelist. So, so this is obvious that throughout the scriptures it has that in there. Okay, and we're going to have some passages for that. But again, all of this, the pastor, the teacher, the prophet, the evangelist, and uh, the apostle are all to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Right? So that's what I want to do tonight is to impart, to help equip you guys with ministry so that you guys can speak or proclaim the good news in the marketplace because it's really, really important. And and oftentimes uh, we'll see that if 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 you're not, people will think that if you're not standing on the corner with a bullhorn, you know, or a blow, or what are those, the foghorns or whatever they call those, or standing on a, a stool and preaching the gospel or proclaiming or standing on a soapbox, and you're not doing that, you're not, you're not evangelizing. I'm sorry, I totally disagree with that. Uh, because I see, I share the gospel all the time, and I see people come to the faith a lot over my my years of ministry, just simply by having a cigar with somebody. Believe it or not, <laughs> you guys all know I enjoy cigars, right? And I'll tell you, I can't tell you how many times I've I've said across somebody, they ask me what I do, and I tell them I'm a, I'm a rabbi. And they're like, "Whoa, really?" And then, but then I'm smoking a cigar with them. 
And they're like, wow, you don't seem too religious. I go, thank you. <laughs> you know, and then we get in a great conversation and I ask them what they do and they tell me they they do this or they do that or, or whatever they do. And because I've had a lot of work experience in my past and because I'm a normal person and I'm just a plain person, I'm able to relate to them where they're at. And believe it or not, as I'm talking to them, I'm using examples from their sphere of understanding and I preach the gospel to them. And it's really amazing how that happens so many times, so many times, everywhere I go, that seems to happen where God puts people in my path on purpose for me to proclaim the good news to them, but in a way that they totally understand. And I think that if we don't learn how to do that, and we think that it's just up to the evangelist and to the office of the evangelist, then we're not fully equipped on our, on our work belt with what God's called us to do. God's called us to go out and make disciples. And if we, we have to understand that making those disciples with it comes from the prospect or comes from the understanding that we make disciples of the saved and the unsaved, believe it or not. You spark up a friendship with somebody who's unsaved and you start spending time with them and you start talking with them and they start seeing your life unfold before you. Believe me, they're watching you. So if you don't think that they're watching you, that's the first mistake. <laughs> they're watching you they're watching your life and you're making a disciple just by your by your uh your um just by your actions and by your your movements and by the things you do and by the things you say so it's really important to understand that whether you believe you're being watched or not you are being watched so mistake number one is do not think that people are watching you okay they are watching you so you make disciples as you go along the way, okay? So this is important. So when we see it here again in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, that God gave the body of believers for some of us to be apostles, evangelists, pastors, teachers, and prophets. And those five offices are to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. That's the way the NIV says, and I like the way the NIV says it. This one says here to equip the Kedoshim for the works of service, for building up the body of the Messiah. And that's really what it's all about is the body of the Messiah. So first of all, it, it's not just to proclaim the good news of salvation. And that's really not what it's about. It's to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom of God. A huge difference, if you guys hear what I'm saying. The church for thousands of years has preached the gospel of salvation. And only recently, well, more recently, they've done it in the past, so I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but people are understanding that the kingdom of God is real, and it's true, and it's living. Some of you that went to the prophetic conference this past weekend understand that you're, that as you go about your your day and as you go about your time that you you start when you start hearing god speak to you about somebody else and you start you start prophesying into their life you start speaking in their life that is involved that is being part of the kingdom of god god is the kingdom of god is very active in today's world so we have to understand that there's two kingdoms out there so the second mistake so the first mistake is not realizing that you're being watched when you're being watched the second mistake is not realizing that there are two kingdoms the kingdom of god and the kingdom of this world basically the kingdom of satan right okay uh, so the kingdom of god is anywhere in the scriptures where you hear the term the kingdom of god the kingdom of heaven and it talks about it talks about the kingdom of, 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 or it just says heaven. Heaven is like this, or the kingdom of God is like this. Those all refer, those all refer to the movement or to the Yeshua movement, the movement of the people of Messiah. Okay, so it's a, it's a euphemism. It's a Hebraism, if you want to, if we say it that way. Anytime you hear Yeshua says the kingdom of God is like such and such, what he's saying is the people that are my, that are part of my my movement are going to be like this the people of my movement are going to believe like this the people of my movement are going to behave like this the people of my movement are going to act like this the people of my movement are going to do this and so forth and so on right so anytime you read that in the scriptures it's not just heaven when god when he says the kingdom of heaven is like this it's an idea here where up what we're thinking is heaven up there 
and somehow we're down in earth down here. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying here is the movement of Messiah and his people, his children are going to behave like this and do such and such and such and such. That's really what it's talking about. So when you read the scriptures and you see that, that's something that you want to be you want to make note okay so when we proclaim the good news it's not just the good news of salvation yes salvation is part of it because we're taken from the kingdom of darkness and we're saved and put into the kingdom of light but that kingdom of light is the same thing as the kingdom of heaven the kingdom of god all of that refers to the movement of messiah to this to this uh you know to this uh movement of the people of God. So that's really what it's talking about. So we have, what we've got to do is share the good news of the kingdom. It's really important. Not just the good news of salvation, but the good news of the kingdom of God. That's what's really important. So, so as we go throughout this thing and talking about this tonight, again, some of you are going to have questions. Is it okay to ask questions? I thought I saw somebody's hand raised here just earlier um and uh, you went black on the screen though and I, all i see is mht 6000 were you saying hi or were you asking a question okay so all right so let me uh, change views here i'm gonna go to speaker view so okay so it's important for us to understand that so let's look at matthew chapter 10 verse 7 and this is why it's important so again we looked at the office of evangelism or uh, the office of an evangelist, which are equipped to do to do uh, specifically teach and equip the kedoshim, the holy ones, to how to minister the gospel. Okay, so that's the office. So I'm kind of stepping in right now into that office, even though I may not be in the office of an evangelist, because we do have people who are definitely gifted with evangelism in our congregation. And uh, it's absolutely amazing that they're gifted in it, but they have not been, some of them have not been trained to equip or to help teach others, okay? So, but I'm stepping in this role because I've done so much street evangelism, so many other things with evangelism, and I, and I do evangelism all the time everywhere I go. Uh, matter of fact, I was doing it today, so it's really good. All right, so Matthew chapter 10, we get here to verse 5. And it shows here, and by the way, this is where Sophia's ministry name comes out of this passage for some of you uh she has as you go ministries that's the name of her ministry for some of you that take her or take her classes and stuff verse 5 it says here matthew chapter 10 verse 5 yeshua sent out these 12 and he ordered them do not go to the gentiles sorry don't get offended by that word the bible uses it it just simply means non-jews and do not enter into any samaritan town but go instead to the lost sheep of the house of israel and then verse 7, as you go, as you go, so as you're going on your way, as you're going about your day, as you're doing what I've called you to do, proclaim the kingdom of heaven has come near. That's another euphemism. That's another Hebraism that the word come near is the same as uh, it is here. It is here. Okay. Yeshua says it'll say the kingdom of, of God has come upon you. And basically what he's saying is the movement of Yeshua has started. The movement of the Messiah is here. And that's what it's really saying. So what he's telling them is as you go, you're going to proclaim to all those around you that, that the Messiah has come and his kingdom is started. That's a pretty bold claim in and of itself, simply saying that. The Messiah has come and his kingdom has begun. That's, that's another translation that could fit this very easily, very well. So we see that here. As you grow... Proclaim the kingdom of heaven has come. And then he says this in verse 8. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse those with sa'arat, uh, leprosy. Drive out demons. Freely you have received. Freely give. So we'll stop there. Freely you have received. Freely give. And, you know, Linda was just just uh, just now after she was eating uh, her meal, she was thanking God for um, for God's mercies that are new every day and new every morning. And, and it really is something that we've been given freely. This gift of salvation and this gift of the kingdom of God, this gift of being able to proclaim the good news of the Messiah or the Messiah has come and his kingdom has started, has been freely given to us. 
Not one of us have done anything to pay for our salvation. And if you have, then, then I would say, uh, give it back. <laughs> okay. If any of you had had to give a, uh, um, uh, penance or you've had to, you know, give tithes. You know, if, if you went to somebody that they want to get saved and they said, okay, you got to give us a thousand dollars and we'll lead you in into uh the, the prayer of salvation. Uh go back and, and uh, get your money. <laughs> get your money back because this has been freely given to us. This is something that has been given to us freely because the price has been paid. And it it wasn't a free thing that took place. You know, by the we found out from the brief Kaddishah, from the cutting of the new covenant, it took all of the blood of Yeshua to establish that that non um, um, what do you call it? unconditional that unconditional covenant with us. So it cost Yeshua, it cost him everything, one hundred percent. He laid his life on the line for us to re freely receive salvation to the kingdom of God and to be welcomed in. So. Freely have been given, freely freely received, so therefore freely give. And so it's important for us to understand that when we share the gospel of the good news with people around us, we don't step into this holiness or to this holy, holy mentality or somehow we turn into this, um, turn into this, uh, you know, anointed preacher or pastor. Believe me, there's times where God's God's uh, anointing comes upon everyone and every single person I'm looking at on the screen here and every person I know can become a, a tremendous orator and a tremendous speaker, uh, somebody who's excellent at speaking the gospel or just they receive courage to stand in front of somebody and they start speaking. But that isn't really what it's saying here. What it's saying is as you go along your way. So as I send you out, Yeshua is saying, and he gave them all the authority to do it. He goes, kill the sick, raise the dead. I mean, like it, like it's nothing. Look, it's nothing because it's been freely given to you. So first, the first thing that we have to write down. So we've talked about two errors that we make. Number one, that even when we're, I mean, people are always watching us. So never think that nobody's watching you. That's number one. The second error that we make is not just the kingdom of salvation that we, we preach. We actually preach the kingdom of God. And salvation is within that kingdom of God in the sense that when you get saved, you are placed into the movement of the messiah and you are part of the family of the messiah okay but the first thing that we have to understand as we proclaim the good news is i just lost my thought where was it did you were you follow me good anybody following me good i just lost my thought um the first talking about preaching not just salvation but the kingdom but the kingdom um, but I'll, oh, in that process is understand the first thing. Thank you. You got me back on track, Barry. Thank you so much. He's listening. At least one person is listening tonight. <laughs> um, no, uh, what what Barry was reminding me of is that we've all been given authority. So write that down. Number one, we've all been given the authority of Yeshua. If you are saved and you are in the kingdom of God, you've been given the authority to proclaim the good news of the kingdom because freely you have been given, so therefore freely you can give. So we are all given authority to proclaim the good news. You don't have to have, uh, I can pull it out for you. You don't have to have a, an ordination cer certificate, <laughs> a card to, you know, to prove that you're a pastor or an evangelist or a teacher or a prophet or a prophetess or whatever. You don't have to have a card with you. We've all been given that authority by the Holy Spirit and by God to proclaim the good news. Okay, that in itself is evangelion. Is evangelion? Evangelion is the Greek, and then we have the lemma, the the Greek root, which is euangelistes. Euangelistes. I can't pronounce it quite right, but you take that Greek word, and that means to be proclaimed. To proclaim. The good news. That's really what it means. Okay, so regardless of who you are, you've all been given the authority. So that's number one. Number two, you all have been commissioned by God to make disciples. You've all been commissioned that. I don't care who you are. Could I ask you a question? Oh, large thing. Okay, so I don't care who we are. 
We've all been commissioned. So let's go to Matthew chapter 28. So you're in Matthew chapter 10. Uh, go over to Matthew 28. And I'm reading up scriptures that are used quite often, but we have to understand that every one of us is, is, is really called to do marketplace evangelism. Okay. Matthew 28, and I will start at verse 16. And it says this. Now the 11 disciples went to the Galel, to the mountain Yeshua had designated. When they saw him, they worshiped, but some wavered. And Yeshua came up to them and spoke to them saying, all of authority. So all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, immersing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So verse 19, he says, go therefore. Go therefore. So it's the same as as you go along the way as you proclaim the good news. And here, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Um, I made a joke of this many years ago. Some guys, some friends of ours that hung around with each other. We came up with the five tools of discipleship. And you guys have heard me joke around about this, I think, from the pulpit a couple of times, especially if you've come to Beth Yeshua uh, for, a, for at least a year, you, you may have heard me say this before. But we've all been given the five tools of discipleship. And now it's changed to pretty much two, two, two tools of discipleship. But back in the day, we used to say the five tools of discipleship are this, to have a Bible, a scripture promise, a piece of paper, a pencil, and enough money for two cups of coffee. <laughs> That's all you really need for discipleship. Again, a Bible, a scripture promise, piece of paper, a pencil, and enough money for two cups of coffee. Okay, so today it could be down to two because this, my phone right here, this phone does everything and it actually even has the money in it to pay for two cups of coffee if you want to do that route i haven't done that route but some people have so all you really need is your bible or is your your smartphone thank you um but so so the five tools of discipleship are pretty much two tools of deception because on your phone you can look up a bible any any bible translation you want you can almost find on your bible God's, if you're a part of the children of God and part of the kingdom of God, God's going to give you a scripture in your heart every single day. Just ask him for one. He'll show you. And if you're studying, you're reading and something sticks out to you, take that passage with you throughout the day, because I'll tell you, it'll, you'll, you'll see it utilized throughout the day. And then, and then obviously having enough money for two cups of coffee, except for coffee just doesn't cost a dollar anymore, you know, so you have to carry at least 10 bucks with you because they'll want a latte or a mocha or something. But, you know, but all it takes is to do that and sit down with them and train them in the scriptures. And everyone is equipped to do this. Everyone has the authority to do this and all of that have been commissioned to do this. So if you think, well, I can't do this, you know, I, I'm not a good speaker. I'm not. Well, yeah, you can. Every one of us knows somebody younger in the Lord than us. Every one of us knows someone who is a brand new believer and 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 let and just let them walk along and be a mentor in their lives. Every one of us has a mentor in our own lives, we get to the point where we realize we've become a pater. Pater is the Greek word for the word father. Okay. And, and so I'm using this for father and mother. You know, the scriptures tell us that older women should train younger women in the Lord, right? We hear that. And it's the same way. There comes a point in your life where you stop being a huyas, uh, a, a son, and you become a pater. You become a father. And I remember specifically when that happened to me, I was in Idaho and I had been pastoring already for many, many years. And I, and I started uh, co-pastoring with another, another pastor and I was doing an, um, a Messianic congregation on Saturdays and on Sundays, I was, I was the co-pastor at a church and my ex, my former wife and I were leading uh, worship and stuff, but I was also, I did most of the teaching from the pulpit and stuff, but, uh, him and I were talking and I said, man, you know, we need, we need some uh, uh, fathers in our, in our congregation here to help train the younger ones. He goes, Adrian, you're, you're a father. You're a father in the faith to a lot of these people. And I'm like, when he said that, I was like, what? <laughs> I was like 45 at the time or something. I go, I always thought I was a Huey Oz. I get, when did I cross over into that father stage? You know, it's like, we know we're, if you have children, obviously you're a father. 
But in the, in the Lord, you become a spiritual father to a lot of people and you don't even realize it. You step into that role. And I would say for everybody I'm looking here online, you're going to reach a time where you realize that you're no longer a, a son or a daughter in Messiah, but you're actually a mother or a father spiritually in the, in the kingdom of God. And it's important to recognize people that are, be, that are younger than you in the Lord and to help disciple them. And God may put somebody specifically on your heart, okay? So we're all called to make disciples. Um, Talmidim is the Hebrew word for that, Talmidim, where we get the word Talmid, which means student. Uh, you get the word today, the Talmud, which means to study or to be of, 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 to be of the student of the Talmud. Um, you have all that kind of stuff. So you have all those words, even though we don't do the Talmud. I'm just kind of explaining that to you guys. But we're all called to walk into that role of, of making disciples. Okay, so everybody is called to this office, not, I mean, office, not to this work of being an evangelist by proclaiming and preaching the good news, but not leaving it there. Not that just the good news of salvation, but the good news of the kingdom of God. And those who you find interested in it, you're called to disciple. And that's what's beautiful about it. And believe it again, that before we move on to some more passages, let me say this. Learning how to disciple unbelievers and believers. Okay, so this is, this is really interesting. When you're discipling a believer, it's great because you can talk about scriptures. You can share a scriptural promise that the Lord gives you. You can share something that God is doing in your own life and how you're dealing with it and how you're walking through it and the failures that you're having. The successes you're having. It's okay to be that open with people that in you know as you're discipling. It's okay to talk about your failures. Some of you have heard some of my failures from the from the bima, from the uh, from up front. You guys have heard me share things up front that I'm not proud of, but I but I'm glad that I walked through those situations in my life because they've opened up a door of ministry into other people's lives, and it's become a it's become a hope. For other people in their lives, uh, some of the, my failures. So never be afraid to sh to be open and honest about your about your weaknesses, because believe me, believe me when I say this, more than you would think are struggling with the same things that you're struggling with. You know the the devil wants to lie to us and tell us that no one, no one else is having this problem, no one else is struggling in this area. Right, you're the only person going through this, and 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 no one, everybody's going to judge you. People are going to uh, throw you under the bus, and people are going to, uh, uh, you know, put a scarlet A across your chest, and we're going to stone you to death. And boy, if Rabbi hears this, or or if uh, so and so finds out about this, believe me, believe me, more people are struggling with the sins that you struggle with, and the errors that you struggle with, than you than not struggling with. Okay, you're not. You're not the only person on this island to go through this process. You're not like, what's that one movie with Tom Hanks, uh, Castaway? You're not the only person that's dealing with something, okay? I guarantee you that a thousand more believers around you are dealing with the same kind of things, whether it be anger, whether it be whatever it is, whatever you're dealing with. I can tell you other people are dealing with those issues as well, okay? So never be afraid when you're making disciples to share your weaknesses with them and to teach them how you've out how you've over you've overcome those things in your life step by step it's taken me years to get through certain weaknesses in my life and i'm still not perfected in some of those areas and i'm sure linda would agree to her own life that there's things that she's had to work on her entire life and there's new things that pop up now that we're married <laughs> I think she would agree to that. Won't you agree yes, to that? <laughs> that, you know, when you get married and you start getting to know each other. I you, need fixed. I need fixed. <laughs> she, and, you know, the funny thing is we both need fixed. And, um, but the thing is, is that that's what iron sharpens iron is like. That's what brothers and sisters do. That's why uh, it says the in the Bible, it says a friend sticks closer than a brother. Um, a true friend, a friend in Messiah is closer than a brother because there's a bonding that takes place of mutual um, honing one another. Like when you hone a knife and sharpen a knife, when you do that and you sharpen that knife, it hurts. You're being scraped. You're being, you're, you're getting all the stuff kind of cut off of you and it hurts. 
But that is what really, really brings this sharpness to your life. So don't be afraid to share your negatives along with your positives. Okay. That shows accountability too to somebody that you're discipling that they feel like, wow, I feel like I can share something with this person. Okay. Now here's, here's the other aspect of making disciples that I really, really want to um, emphasize before, before we move on. When you are making, when you are working with somebody and you're discipling somebody, it's absolutely, utterly important. And this, I can't say this any lighter than earth. I can't say this any lighter than what I'm going to say. Your job is not to gossip about that person and their weaknesses and their failures. Okay? Your job is to mentor them through those failures and those weaknesses. Your job is not to go and gossip and tell everybody how bad they are or how evil or how wicked they are. I'm telling you guys up front, that is not discipleship. That is Lashon Hara. That is the evil tongue. That is wrong. Okay. You want, if you are taking on a role of being a disciple to, or discipling someone, you have to let them fail and you have to let them walk through those failures in their lives and have complete, utter trust in you that you're not going to share their failures with the whole world. If that happens, then what happens is you truly have to get discipled again. You truly have to have to submit yourself to someone else again to help you get discipled because it, that's not what it's about. And unfortunately, I see that happen in, in the kingdom of God all too often. And this is why people are afraid to share some of their weaknesses in their life. This is why people don't grow in Messiah is because they're afraid to share their struggles because they believe they're going to be thrown under the bus. They believe they're going to be kicked out of the church or out of the congregation. They believe they're going to face, uh, you know, um, discipline from the rabbis. They're going to come down with them, you know, and everybody else is going to come down with them. And so we have people that pretend to be good in front of everybody. They come to services on Shabbat and pretend to be okay in their lives, but they're falling apart in areas or their marriages are falling apart or they're dealing with issues that they're afraid to bring forward because they're afraid of being kicked out. Now, granted, there are times when those things happen and those are times when there are times when that needs to happen. But just because let's say some young man is struggling with pornography doesn't mean we're going to kick him out of the congregation. We're going to work with that person as best as we can to get them through that process. And if, But if you're a mentor in their lives, and let's say you find out that someone is, is struggling with pornography, and the first thing you do is go to the, the rabbis, then you're not truly discipling this person. Because then what you're doing is taking this person, and instead of discipling them, you're throwing that person onto the leadership or to the rabbis and say, you deal with that person. I don't want to go there. You deal with that person. But what you just did is took a confidence, even though you came to your rabbi, you took someone's confidence, somebody who confidentially shared into your life. You've taken that and you brought it forth to a group of people that didn't need to hear it at this point, because sometimes the rabbis have to now step when they when they hear that they have to step in. And unfortunately, when they step in and this other person finds out, then then what happens is like, well, how did you find out? I only shared it with so-and-so. Well, so-and-so came to us because they're concerned about you. It turns into this huge thing. Now, yes, we have to deal with sin, but every one of us have to deal with sin. And the person who just gossiped that to the leadership has to deal with that own sin there itself. So I, I can't say it enough is that we're all commissioned to make disciples by Yeshua. All of us are commissioned to do this as we go. We've all been given the authority to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God. But we have to do it in wisdom, in sincerity, in truth, and in love. We have to be people that are willing to get offended by someone else's sin because Yeshua did. Did Yeshua tell the prostitute or the woman that found in, in adultery to leave, leave his sight or to leave? No. He, he looked at everybody and said, We're, you know, the one who has no sin cast the first stone. Everybody dropped their rocks, walked away. And then he says, look around. Do you see your accusers? There's no one. And he goes, therefore, I don't accuse you too. He forgave her. And he says, now go and sin no more. And she became a faithful servant of his. 
right? We've all heard the story. We've all seen that. We see the lady at the well who was married, what, seven times now? Or, in the, or she was married, was it seven times? And the man that she's living with now was not even her husband. And, you know, she's doing, you remember the, remember the lady at the well, the Samaritan at the well, the lady? I think and it was five. It was five. Yeah, maybe five. And and he goes, and the one you're living with now isn't even your husband. Was Yeshua offended by her sin or was he saying, let, let me embrace you and let me get you through this process? She turned around and brought the entire town almost to the kingdom of God. <laughs> she became she became an evangelist to her entire community and got them out to hear the gospel preached from Yeshua and the whole community came to faith. I mean, think about that for a minute. Talk about establishing a congregation in a community. You know, maybe we should go to the wells and look for for uh uh, uh what is it? People who are uh what's yeah, the word? So, no, yeah. polygamists. Maybe we should look for polygamists. <laughs> but but you but you see what I'm saying is it you can't be offended by somebody's sin you should never be shocked by somebody's sin because we were dead in our sins and now we're alive in messiah and all too often people get saved they start walking on the on the forgiveness scale and all of a sudden they think before they realize it they're up on this pedestal or not even a pedestal they're up on the top of a of a high a skyscraper and anyone else who has sin in their lives they're quick to throw them away as if somehow they have they attain this on their own, but we don't obtain it on our own. This has been given to us as a free gift, so therefore we freely give. And we got to remember that we are we are we are no better in just being a human being than most people around us. But we walk humbly before the Lord, knowing that our sins are there. We repent of our sins. We ask for forgiveness. We admit when we're wrong. We we take responsibility and ownership for what we do. And when you disciple people and they see that in your life, they're going to say, wow, this is a beautiful way of living. I don't have to perform. I don't have to act. I don't have to pretend. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to hold back from this person because, um, because I know that they're not going to use this against me. I know they're not going to stab me in the back. So number number two is do not get offended by people's sin. Okay? Do not get offended by people's sin around you. And here's the biggest key of wisdom I can give into this is that if there's a person, there's sin. <laughs> You come across people, you'll find sin. <laughs> okay, the word sin means to miss the mark. The Hebrew word is chata or chata, which means to miss the mark. It's to sin, right? So when we sin, we miss the mark. It's it's like a I'm a bow hunter, and so when I pull out that bow and I put that arrow on there and I shoot that arrow, when I shoot that arrow and I let it go, I'm shooting for the bullseye. But if you notice, there's typically not just a small little place for the arrow to go but it's it's a bullseye it really covers a huge portion and if i hit a deer anywhere in an area like this if i'm out hunting and i'm going to i'm going to fatally injure that deer i don't have to hit the red dot the bullseye to to bring a fatal blow i just have to do this well sin is like this sin is where you miss that red dot and you go off OK, and you just go enough off. And believe me, if you're a person, you've committed sin. If you are a person, you will sin. The difference is, is that those that are in the kingdom of God have a mediator that stands before the father for us that we can go through. And Yeshua himself says in, in John chapter 14, verse six, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the father, but through me. You can't come to the father any other way except for through Yeshua. Anything out, outside of Yeshua is missing the mark. It's, it's sin. You can't get there by your own means. So, 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 that's, so number one is what? We've all been given authority to proclaim the good news. Number two, we're all commissioned to, 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 proclaim, to, to proclaim the good news. Mm -hmm. Number three, don't get offended by people's sin. Okay. And partly is because we know that, um, partly is because we all sin, right? 
And number four, okay, number four here is, is, yeah, I'm getting ready to, oh. she wrote down, you wrote down number four, that's good, she was getting ready for it. <laughs> number four is, you guys ready for this? This is the biggest way to, to be, uh, to build disciples, is be real, be real. Write that down, type that down, do whatever, take notes if you're taking notes, be real. Most people can see through your lies, your phoniness, your hypocrisy. Most people can tell when you're just giving them a story. Not everybody, but most people. Somebody dear in my life that I love dearly in my life can sit there and tell me the grandest story. I mean, and make up. I mean, and I'm just looking at this person that I love. It's not Linda, by the way. Okay, just so you guys, you guys know. But we'll go on and on about something that they did, and I know it's complete BS. Or wait, I'm sorry, I'm on video. Oh, I was just being real, wasn't I? Okay, so complete poo poo. Okay, hitting a fan. <laughs> okay, so being real with people, and I think that's being authentic. So being authentic is really, really important. Uh, so you can write down the word real or authentic, but being sincere. When someone's talking with you, really listen. Really pay attention to what they're saying. When somebody's sharing a sin with you, really show empathy with them and, and, and walk with them through that process. When somebody asks for somebody to, to, to be accountable, you know, they want you to, to hold them accountable for something they're struggling with, hold them accountable. And don't fall into that same sin with them, but hold them accountable. And, and the way you hold people accountable is you just simply check in on them and ask them how they're doing. Hey, I was thinking about you today. Um, I'll, t I'll tell you, some of the best accountability partners in, in our lives um, are, are in our lives is you find people that you can be accountable with that are struggling with the same thing you're struggling with. So that way, when you're struggling with it, you start praying for other people. Okay, let's say you struggle with anger. And you go to an anger management group and you meet somebody there that's a brother in the Lord that's struggling with anger. And you become good friends and you connect with good friends. When you start getting angry, start praying for them right away. Start immediately praying for them. Lord, I pray for my brother to just, Lord, to, to let him learn how to be angry and sin not. Give him the ability to, to really walk away from from his anger and learn how to handle his anger and learn how to control his anger and be a man under self-control lord i pray for the the fruits of the spirit in that person's life for love joy peace patience kindness goodness gentleness faithfulness and self-control to be over my brother when you start doing that the lord starts doing something in you so oftentimes when you hold somebody to accountable a lot of times you're going to find yourself you struggle with the same thing that you're holding somebody in accountability with and you find yourself keeping each other in check and keeping each other in prayer and you stay authentic you stay real you do not become haughty you do not become um uh, prideful okay so that's really really important so number one again um, um we've all been given authority number two we're all been commissioned to share the good news. Number three, do not easily get offended by people's sin. And number four is be real or authentic. Be sincere. Okay? So those are really, really important when we're becoming, learning how to share the gospel of the kingdom of God. Again, not just the gospel of salvation, but the gospel of the kingdom of salvation of the kingdom of God. There's a kingdom of the world. And a kingdom of God. All right, so um, uh, let's go to Acts. I want to show you a couple of places here where there are people. Acts chapter twenty-one, where there is a person that actually moved in the the gift or the office of evangelism, but wasn't part of the apostles. And so that's for us just to be con to confirm that we are called to all of us to share the the good news of the kingdom. So uh, Acts chapter 21, verse 8, I'll start at verse 7. When we had finished the trip from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemaeus. We greeted the brothers and the sisters and stayed with them for one day. On the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea. We entered the home of Philip, the proclaimer of the good news. So in some translations, it'll say Philip, the evangelist. 
Okay, so it'll say that the Philip, the proclaimer of the good news, who was one of the seven, and we stayed with him. Now, this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. So we see here women moving in the prophetic here, right? Uh, so we see four, believe it or not, they weren't married either. You can actually be a virgin and prophesy as well. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> and have the gift of prophecy. Okay, so that was a little joke for some of you. Some of you are laughing. Come on now, you should be laughing. This is good news of the kingdom of God. No, I'm just joking. So the, the thing is, is, is here we see two, two gifts operating right here, just in this small little thing. We see the gift of evangelism or the proclaimer or the office, not so much the office, but definitely the gift of evangelism, where this person was a proclaimer of the good news. And then he had he had daughters, uh, four daughters, um, that that uh, that prophesied. Pretty powerful there. So we see here, we see here that the proclaimer of the good news uh, can be anyone. You're not. It's not an office. It can be just simply who you are. So let's talk a little bit here about. Okay, well, actually, let's read a couple of other ones here. Go to first, Second Timothy, Second Timothy, chapter four, verse five. Second Timothy chapter four, verse five. So we see in Ephesians chapter four, it talks of Ephesians chapter four, uh, Ephesians four eleven says that God gave some as an apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And Second Timothy chapter three, verse fourteen, all the way through. We get to chapter four. It's talking about equipping God's people as well. We get to verse four of chapter four, and it says, and they will turn away from hearing the truth and wander to myths. You, however, keep a clear mind in all things, withstand hardship, do the work of proclaiming the good news and fulfill your service. So again here, do the work of an evangelist. Do the work of someone who proclaims the good news. OK, so we see this here where where Shaul is urging them to do this. OK, or I mean, yeah, he's telling Timothy to, to encourage those. And he's telling, uh, you know, Timothy, Paul is actually telling Timothy, keep doing the work of an evangelist. But but Paul sent Timothy to uh, uh, to Ephesus to to actually proclaim uh, to be like kind of build them up and, and strengthen them if you look at it. Okay, so then we come to uh, 1 Corinthians, flip back to 1 Corinthians. I only got a couple more passages, and we're going to share a story, and then you guys can share some stories as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, or chapter 1, yes. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. And this is Paul himself. Now, Shaul was an apostle, and like we said earlier, not all of, uh, all of the apostles were evangelists, but not all evangelists are apostles. But here, Shaul, we see here in verse 17, it says, for Messiah sent me not to immerse. So he, he didn't feel like he was sent to do baptism, but to proclaim the good news, not with cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Messiah would not be made of no, no effect. So we see here where Shaul was called to proclaim the gospel of the kingdom. Not necessarily to baptize, not necessarily to stick around, even though we know he stood around, he, he stayed in many communities and delivered uh, not only the message, but helped train and equip them for, for works of service. But we see here where God is doing a, a beautiful work here. Okay, so we see that. And then, um, and then uh, in I'm going to flip you over again to 1 Peter. Flip back to 1 Peter. First Peter. Somebody's mic is on. Can you everybody make sure you mute? There we go. Okay, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse Says, I'll start at verse 13. So 1 Peter chapter, chapter 3, verse 13. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not be afraid or worry about their threats. Instead, 
oops, I got something going on here on my my thing. I don't know what it was. That's weird. Instead, uh, uh, instead, sanctify us as Lord in your hearts. Always be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, yet with humility and reverence, keeping a clear conscience so that whatever you are accursed of, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Messiah may be put to shame. Okay, so he's saying here, be, be ready to share or to defend. That's where we get the word apologetics from. So if any of you have heard that, uh, that so-and-so is a great, an he's a awesome apologist, right? Anytime you hear that term, an apologist or apologetics, it means to defend the gospel or to defend your faith or defend what you believe in. Um, that actually, if you work, if you, if you work on any, uh, graduate, uh, graduate program, your job in your master's and your, your doctoral degree is to write either a thesis or a dissertation. And even your term papers are to state and defend your position. So, uh, this is, that's apologetics. That's really what it's about. So not only do we study the scriptures to show ourselves approved, but we're ready to give an answer for what we believe when we're questioned and even when we suffer for our faith, okay? So that right there in itself makes each and every one of us understand this important role that we have that we've been commissioned to make disciples. We have to be ready to defend what we believe and, and to stand on that belief, okay? So we do all that. So I'm just kind of looking at, there's a whole bunch more scriptures that I can bring up, but I wanted to share, uh, share with you, okay, a couple of stories on marketplace evangelism. Okay, so um, so Linda and I buying this new car. The two people we walk into the dealership happen to be two brand new, still wet behind the ear trainees, hadn't sold a car yet, right? They come, they come walking out, and uh, they're working together as a team, and they're trying to, you know, I was sold on a vehicle right away. We didn't get the vehicle I wanted. We got a different vehicle, but the vehicle I wanted, I was sold on it right away. Linda was like. And to her, it's like money and debt, money and debt. She's dying over it. She's like, no, 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 no. And, and they kept buttering up to me. And I kept, I'm not the one you guys have to butter up to. It's Linda you got to butter up to, not me. I'm, you, I'm sold, man. I'm buying the vehicle, but I can't buy it unless she's on board. But anyhow, these two guys that come walking out are Jews. Okay. And uh, one of them still goes to a shul. The other one was, they both had their bar mitzvah. We're driving around in the in the vehicle, and we're just test driving, and we're test driving forever. We even <laughs> they even took us out to lunch. Yeah. <laughs> they took us out to lunch, and we're talking, and we're doing the bracha there. Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Malatalam. We're sitting there, you know, they're non non believing Jews, and and uh, uh, and we're sitting there, and just I'm sharing my faith, and we're talking about, it. and I said, you know, you guys might think we're crazy, but. Uh, you know, we're Messianic Jews, you know, I believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, I don't hold to the rabbinical stuff, and they didn't either, which is funny, because one of them uh, kind of is, is is orthodox in a way, and then the other one had his bar mitzvah, and he hasn't really been to shul in a long time, services in a long time, or a congregation, um, so he hasn't, you know, he hasn't done that, but we're sitting there just sharing our faith with him, and man, they just started opening up, didn't they? They just started talking about everything, ask questions, and we were bringing in Yeshua, and one of them absolutely understood um, some aspects of the New Testament. And you know what? Yeshua didn't offend them. Jesus, even the term Jesus didn't offend them. You know, we're all told, you know, be careful how you minister to Jews, and you got to say this, and you got to say that, and you got to say this, and you got to say that. And, and just being in the marketplace. Now, obviously, they're wanting to make a sale, so they have a motive, <laughs> or they have an agenda. I'm sorry, they, they have an agenda, but we sparked up such a good conversation with them that even when we left, and I said, guys, listen, we're not going to buy today. Uh, thank you for letting us test drive, but Linda need, really needs to be on this 100%, and I said, you, you guys you guys are buttering up to me, but you need to butter up to her because she's the one who's going to make this decision, but, but in that whole time, we made a pretty good friendship with them. I mean, really, really seriously. I mean, like so much so that uh, uh, Zach 
the one of the guys that when we actually went back to buy, he had called me to see if I still wanted, if I was still interested in that trail. It was a Jeep Trailhawk, which was a gorgeous, yeah. brand new, gorgeous vehicle. Oh my gosh, you know. And I told I told Linda, even if we were billionaires, I'd still buy this Trailhawk. You know, I, I wouldn't buy I wouldn't buy a Lamborghini or something. I'd buy the trail because it's just an awesome vehicle. And I love I love uh, something that's practical, going hunting, pulling a camper trailer. I like something practical. But um, but anyhow, we were uh, we we just and they and Zach stayed with me, and he had still hadn't sold anything, and and Linda and I were concerned because he's been working there for a couple of weeks now, and he's like on the verge of you know it's like he's got to make money or they they you know they tell me he, he can't work there or something, and we're like man maybe we should just buy a vehicle for him so that he doesn't go broke, and so I we were talking and I, and I go well do you have anything that's used that's actually under forty thousand miles and that's good. And so he got back to me and he sent another, he sent a picture of it. And I looked at it and I said, okay, he goes, he goes, you guys sure you don't want the trail walk? I go, Hey, listen, Zach, that's too much money. And we can't afford something I and mean, we can afford it, but it was like, we don't want to go um, so heavily in debt and all that kind of stuff. I said, but, um, but I said, we'll take a look at this other vehicle. And I said, we almost feel bad for you, man. We need to buy something so that you could, so you don't get fired. <laughs> and I said, you know, you're a Jew, you know, I'm a Jew. We got to, we got to protect each other, you know? And, and uh, we had a really good conversation. I had a lot of fun. He's a good kid. He's a, he's a good kid. He's, and then he show, opens up and starts talking about battling Crohn's disease that he's had. He's lost a lot of weight. Um, he's been dealing with a lot of stuff. And, uh, and when I came in and, you know, when we went in to go buy it, we, I told him, I go, man, we, you know, we feel so bad. We have to buy for you. Then he goes, well, you know, I, I actually sold my first vehicle yesterday. I go, yeah, but when you talked to me, you hadn't. He goes, no. He goes, my first vehicle was yesterday. I said, so this is your second vehicle? He goes, yeah. I go, mazel tov. We're high-fiving and, you know, we're all doing all kinds of stuff. And uh, uh, he's been real thorough and he allowed me to get into my vehicle a couple of times. And I went there today to get something. I left some credit cards in the Jeep and they actually found them and, uh, uh, you know, um, called me up so I can go pick them up. Um, hold on a second. But before, but be, but I just want to tell you is that just being real, being authentic with this person, inviting him to shul, we invited him to, you know, I said, hey, we'll buy from you if you come to services at least once. I said, you're going to think we're Meshugana, but come at least once. He goes, okay, I'll come. I go, no, 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 don't say it. You're going to come. He goes, yeah, I'll come. And he knows where we live and he's, he lives close by. So he lives actually close to our shul. Um, so, or to our congregation. So just being real and authentic and joking around and talking, their guards were down big time. And we were able to share the gospel and we were able to share why Yeshua is the Messiah and why we believe he's the Messiah. And they were, they were, they were excited to see that Linda not being Jewish was, you know, knows the prayers and knows the blessings and, and seeing this and, and, and it was exciting. We talked about guns and we, we talked about all kinds of things. What were you I say? just wanted to add that um, he, you are the aroma of life to him because he wants to learn golf. From yeah. Him. Oh, and so he also wants to learn golf. Future contact. Yeah. Yeah. And because we were, we were, we were talking about golf too. And I said, I'm a golf teaching pro. And he goes, seriously? He go, I go, yeah, I'd love to teach you golf. I said, my first lesson will be free, you know? And that's marketplace evangelism. You're willing to sacrifice part of your life. You're willing to sacrifice part of your business. You're willing to sacrifice things in your life. Not only, I mean, it's what's really cool is I'm not just doing this to win him over and to place him in the kingdom of God. That is huge and that is important. But I want him to know that he's not alone in this pursuit of life that we, you know, this, this thing that we call life. He's not alone in his Crohn's disease. He's not alone um, in struggling to, to make money at work. And that there are people out there that really do care and, and are concerned. And uh, he's a great guy. And then actually, when we went back to clean out my car, I was totally honest with what was going on with my Jeep. We ended up being on the, I think the dealership went under. They didn't realize they went under because when they were working on my car, it initially started where I took my Jeep in because the air conditioning hadn't been working. And I took it in to get it fixed. And they gave me uh, like $2,100 $2, just to fix the air conditioner. There were some other things that were wrong. And I said, okay. I said, we need it fixed. I mean, I'm just dying in the car. I mean, I'm sweating like a mad dog driving down the road and everything else. 
Um, I said, yeah, we need it fixed. And then they were trying to sell us a vehicle. Well, the, the sales department didn't communicate with the mechanical or the repair department, uh, the service department. They didn't communicate back and forth. And when we were making the deal on this used vehicle, I said, I said, I'll take this used, or I mean, the way it is now, or if we fix it, then you need to give us such and such. I said, we're, we're prepared to get it fixed and then give it to you guys at that, at a certain rate, or you can give us the money for what it is right now. And they didn't talk with the service department, but I guess they found a few other problems and they had already put like 12 hours of work into it and all this kind of stuff. So I got a great deal on, uh, we not only got a good deal on the Jeep that we bought, but I got a good deal on my, my vehicle as is sold to them as now, the way it was. And it was all torn apart. <laughs> when we went back to the Jeep to get all the stuff, it was torn apart. Like, I mean, it literally, they had taken off everything to get to the, they had to place a new housing unit on my air conditioner. It just wasn't a simple switch. It was the entire housing unit in the air conditioner. So I had to tear apart the entire front end. I mean, the interior front end of the Jeep. I mean, the steering wheel, everything was off. And, um, and they were like, whoa, you guys should have told us that you guys were going to, uh, that you guys bought this because we just put 12 hours in this and we found some other problems. Um, and so we ended up finding out that we did it. And, and then Zach, the guy who sold us the vehicle got in trouble a little bit from the boss, kind of got chewed out a little bit, not real heavily. We got chewed out and said, you know, you should have dealt with the service department before you took the trade and all that. And, and it's like, he goes, well, my manager took the trade. I didn't take the trade, you know, type of thing. And so Zach shared that with us. And so you see what I'm saying is that he wouldn't have shared that with us if we had not sparked up a friendship with him and and had good communication with them and really showed ourselves to be authentic that's really what marketplace evangelism is like people want to see real and i i don't i won't use this term but i i, I will use this term they want to see authentic christianity okay or we can say authentic messian messianic judaism or authentic god if that's a better term OK, they want to see God authentically in your life and people need to see an authentic faith in your life. They truly need to see that. And, and when they see that, I tell you, walls break down. I see it all the time. I see it at the at the cigar lounge. I see it at the dealership. I see it in the grocery store. Everywhere I go, when they see an authentic Adrian being a person of faith who's authentic and real and seems to be just a normal guy that isn't holier than thou and isn't preaching down on them and telling them how bad their sin is and they're going to hell if they don't repent. Those things are true. I leave that up to the office of an evangelist and then to an evangelist to actually do those things and say those things that they want. But marketplace evangelism, where I really excel in is that I find I find that the more authentic I am with the person that I'm sharing the good news with, the more they respond to, the more they hold on to it. And what's funny is I start discipling them before they're even saved. Okay, so that's really important. So as we're as we're talking about marketplace evangelism, remember you can disciple a non-saved person. These two Jewish people, like this other guy Eugene, he ended up leaving. He uh, ended up quitting. He had a better deal that came up, so he never ended up selling his first vehicle. But I made really good connection with this guy, and I'm going to reach out to him and and just reach out to him and see how he's doing. And hopefully he's he's being successful and all that kind of stuff. When they see an authentic person, um, uh, it's great. And I talked to them about my basketball tryouts um, years ago. I talked to them about hunting and you know, those kind of things, just being authentic and real. And they got to see that there's a different side to, to God than what they grew up with. And that's really what marketplace evangelism is all about. We're all called to do it. And it's learning how to walk in discernment. So that's the fifth thing that you can write down there is walk in discernment. Walk in discernment. And let me show you how it works a little bit. because. Because they were Jews and they had their bar mitzvah and they were sports, uh, uh, you know, they were, they liked sports and um, Eugene played football, Eugene played football uh, and all this kind of stuff. Because we were talking about those things, I utilized those aspects to bring about the good news. 
and Yeshua did it all the time. He comes across somebody that is, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, that's that's paralyzed, and he says, "Hey, do you want to get healed? You guys have seen Chosen, right? You've seen that the one where uh, the guy by the water, uh, uh, by the pool of Siloam, where the first one in got got healed, and this one guy was getting." pushed off away every time he was trying to get into the pool to get healing. He never made it, you know, and yet Yeshua brought healing to him. Right. And, and the beautiful thing is that you, you, you talk with people where they're at. That's what you have to do in marketplace evangelism. You have to discover that this is how you use discernment in those situations. Right. Uh, when Linda and I were at the cigar bar about three weeks ago, maybe a month ago, just talking to a guy, just made up conversation because the cigar is the focal point at a, a cigar bar. If you're there, they don't care what your background is financially. They don't care what if you're rich or you're poor, uh, if you're black or you're white, or if you're Asian, it doesn't matter. The cigar is the focal point. And it's amazing how there's a camaraderie and a brotherhood like it's almost like bikers if you're on a bike and you see other bikers you kind of wave at each other as you're going by on the bike you throw your left arm out and you kind of wave at each other there's a camaraderie that comes just by being a biker the same kind of thing happens with guys who smoke cigars they don't care your background but what happens is you start sparking a conversation with them and they start bringing up their life and and because i've been involved in so many different things um and i was a cat i was a professional driver um um I was a professional driver from, what do you call it, uh, by doing a valet, taxi, uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, uh, limousine driver, all those kinds of things for a lot of years. This one guy that we sparked a conversation up with owns a high dollar um, um, taxi service or limousine, limousine service. And, and I'll tell you, we went, we talked about each other about that. And then I incorporated the gospel into that. Okay. The gospel of the kingdom into that and invited him to also learn golf, invited him to our congregation, uh, got his phone number. I've texted him back a couple of times. Um, and he really wants to take golf lessons, but he's also curious about faith because he went into it and says, let me ask you a little bit about, about your faith, you know, about your religion. And he started asking questions. Mm -hmm. And you will find that most people will do it. Another way to have people open up in marketplace evangelism is to ask them if you want to pray for them. Rarely does somebody turn down prayer. Rarely. You see somebody uh, hurting or somebody that's sad and you ask them, hey, you know, I kind of, are you okay? And they say, well, I'm struggling with something right here. Thank you for asking. Thank you for noticing. Hey, do you mind if I pray for you? Most people would say, yeah, I would really appreciate your prayers. I would really thank you for your prayers. Okay, now, if you're courage, if you have the courage to, to pray for them right there and then, then go for it. Um, I shared with you guys years ago before I became, uh, I came on as the assistant rabbi and I was just, I flew down just to speak. And I think it was in August of uh, 2019. No, it could have been 2020. I flew down to speak here at, at Beth Yeshua. And on Friday, uh, just I was at the hotel and I thought, you know, I'm going to go down to the beach and just kind of rest and just pray and, and, and kind of uh, just seek the Lord. And so I drove down to the beach and I parked by Las Olas, the parking lot there at Las Olas there in Fort, Fort Lauderdale, you know, where you park in that parking lot right along the beach. Then you have the Las Olas uh, beachfront walk right there. I parked in that parking lot or I went in that parking lot to park. And then I was sitting there thinking, man, I'm really hungry. Should I go get something to eat? Should I not get something to eat? And when I was there, right next to me was this young lady. And I saw that notice uh, that I noticed uh, in a car next to me. And I just kind of looked over at her. You know, I was like, oh, wow, you know, cute person, whatever. And I'm sitting here like this. And I thought, you know, I think I'm going to go eat. So I, I drove out, went out of the parking lot, went up Las Olas, looked for some place to eat. And I thought, well, I can't afford that. I can't afford that. <laughs> So I ended up just going to some place and getting some chicken. Where I've been gone for about an hour, hour and a half. Come back, park in the same spot, or not in the same spot, in a different area in the parking lot. And then I just walk out to the beach. Well, I'm hanging out at the beach for about 25, 30, 40 minutes. And the same young lady that I parked next to when I first came like an hour earlier, or actually had been an hour and a half at that time or whatever, walked right in front of me 
And we're the only two on the beach as far as I can look one direction, as far as I can look the other. So it was in August. I don't know why, but it was like we were like there were people were far away one way or the other. She comes walking right by me. She's very wearing a very um, thin bathing suit to say, you know, just to, you know, you know, that kind of thing. She comes past me, sits down pretty much right right in front of me but a little bit away is like maybe 20 20 25 yards away from me and i'm just sitting there and at first i'm praying i'm just talking to the lord you know um uh, and all that kind of thing and she walks by me and it was really hard not this is before we got married this was really hard not to notice how beautiful she was she was young and beautiful and everything like that and then the lord looked uh, he said i want you to look at her and i'm saying but lord <laughs> i don't want to look at her <laughs> Yeah, I'll look like a pervert. <laughs> but I'm sitting there going, okay. Uh, so I, I look over at her and then her head was down between her. So she was sitting on, you know, with her knees up and she had her hands down and her head was down. And I was looking over at her and she was, she was like in tears. And she looked totally, totally upset about something. I don't know what was going on, but she looked totally, totally upset about something. And so he says, I want you to pray for her. So I started praying for her. And then the Lord spoke to my spirit and said, I want you to talk to her and tell her how much I love her and that I see her. You know, the scripture, I'm the God who sees. He says, you tell her that I see her and that I love her. I'm thinking, Lord, I'm going to look like I'm going to look like this old pervert trying to pick up this young lady, you know, who's wearing a, a G string. This is not good. <laughs> I go, this is going to look really bad. And I'm struggling with that. I don't want to talk to her and I didn't want to come up to her and, and do all that kind of stuff. But the Holy Spirit kept checking on me, but I kept praying for her and kept praying for her. And I thought, okay, I'm trying to build up the courage to go talk to her because it's not easy to do these things, especially when the Lord is leading you into this situation. It's not easy to share with somebody. If the Lord's putting it on your heart and you're the only person around and she's the only person around, you know, the Holy Spirit's speaking to you. So I got up. Uh, to, and started getting all my stuff ready and I didn't really want to go walk over to her and start talking to her because I didn't know how to hi you know can I talk to you I'm a you know I'm you know I, I didn't know how to start the conversation and um but as I was grabbing my stuff and everything like that and getting ready to walk over to her I stand up and I turn around and she's like right next to me because there was a trail to go back to the cars and she had got up I didn't see her get up she started walking right towards me and we were like right there and I said, hi. And she goes, hi. I go, um, excuse me. And she looks at me and I go, can I ask you something? Or I, can I talk to you? And she goes, she just looks at me. And I go, you know, I noticed that um, you look pretty upset about something. And I said, I just, I feel like the Lord wants to tell me or tell you that he sees you and that he loves you. And she's looking at me and she starts crying. Just starts crying. And I didn't know what to do at that point. I was like, you know, I mean, it's like, do I pray for her? What do I do? I just, and she just cried. And then I told her, I said, I'm here in town actually visiting. And I flew down, I'm speaking at a congregation this weekend. Um, and I said, I'm, I'm a pastor. I didn't, you know, I didn't want to tell her I'm a rabbi because she, she was, she wasn't Jewish, but you could tell that she, she probably would have like not understood. So I just said, I'm a pastor. I'm a messianic rabbi. I did say that actually. So I said, um, can I, can I, would you like to sit down and talk? And she's just looking at me. She goes, she goes, no, she goes, but thank you. I, I mean, what you just said right there was really big. What you said was really good. I go, well, I would, I would pray for you and I'll keep you in prayer. I said, but you need to know he loves you. And, and this is what he told me to tell you that he loves you and that he sees you. He sees you right where you're at. And I said, don't give up hope. Don't do anything that uh, would hurt yourself. You know, and I just simply shared with her my heart. And she was in tears and she said, thank you so much. And we we left with a smile on her face. She left with a smile on her face. Now, I didn't do a huge amount of evangelism with her. I didn't do this. I didn't go into it. I didn't lead her in the salvation, you know, the, the sinner's prayer. I didn't lead her in any of that stuff. I simply did what the Lord asked me to do. And I have to trust that the Holy Spirit continued to do the work that he was going to do. And that the person who is going to lead this person to the Lord, or maybe this person already is in the kingdom of God. And they're already saved. And they just needed to hear that that God loves them and he sees them where they're at. So those are a couple of stories. That, that's marketplace evangelism. 
that's having the tools uh, and being ready to just share your faith, being equipped with with wisdom, with uh, uh, what was the last thing, Dis uh, discernment, um, having the five tools of discipleship, which now, like I said, is only two tools, right? Your phone and enough money for two cups of coffee. I'm, I'm telling you, I can't tell you how many things will open up in your life if you're looking for that. So if you if you if you think that you're not an evangelist, that might be true. You may not have the gift of evangelism or be called to the office of evangelism, but we're all called to be proclaimers of the good news of the kingdom, and we're all commissioned to do it, and we've all been given authority to do it. So you have the authority, and you have the tools to do it. You have a Bible. You have a scripture promise that God is speaking to you in your life. You have, you have a piece of paper and a pencil or your phone where you can take notes with them and you can talk to them about it. And you can, you, you have, and hopefully you have enough money for two cups of coffee. And then you get to share God's good news with somebody who truly needs it. And it may simply be something as simple as uh, that happened with me, this, with that lady on the beach. It may be that simple of a thing where you just simply say, God sees you and he wants to know that he loves you. See that? Anybody else want to share a story that they have, a marketplace evangelistic story that they want to share? Or anybody have questions with what we talked about tonight? Go ahead. Is Jacob, you got your hand raised? Yeah, I don't have a story, but I have a revelation that I had this past week, and I, I think it may be helpful if yeah. that's okay. Yeah. So I, I was reading the Bible. And I was reading about the, the Passover when he when he gave the disciples the wine and the bread. And I had this revelation. I was like, hold up. I was like, I was like home alone. I was like, whoa. I was like, there are 12 disciples. I was like, there are 12 disciples. And then I went in the brief of Shah, it says that I will write the Torah on their hearts and I'll have a I'll make a new covenant with with the tribe or the house of Israel and the house of Judah, 12 tribes. 12 people, one room, new covenant. They're all Jewish. He's Jewish. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> I was like, the whole thing is Jewish. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That's awesome. That's right. awesome. Well, let me give you uh, guys one tool also to speak to Jews specifically. Um, before Marcel, uh, you, before I answer you guys, you have your hand raised. Thank you, Jacob. That's really encouraging. That's awesome. And that revelation is great. And see, that right there will equip you to minister to Jewish people right there and then. You know what I'm saying? It's like, listen, guys, these these are coincidences. This thing just doesn't happen. The Holy Spirit is truly orchestrating this thing. But one way that you can evangelize Jewish people, and let me just say how you can you can just share your faith with Jewish people, is first of all, ask them. And this is the most important thing that I have found when I minister to Jewish people. Um, I have led Jewish people to the Lord, and typically it goes to this realm. I don't start sharing the gospel with them. I don't start, uh, what do you call it, telling them that Jesus is Messiah and all this kind of stuff. I say to them, I say this specifically, what is your calling as a Jew? As a Jewish person, what has God called you to do in your life? And they have no clue. The majority of Jewish people you talk to will not have a clue what you're talking about. And I tell them, I, I go from there and I, because they'll say, well, I mean, I was a doctor, I was a lawyer, I was, uh, you know, a seamstress, I did this, I did that, I was a secretary, whatever it is. But I say, but as the Jewish people, as you being called part of the chosen people and being part of that, that chosen people of God, what is your calling in your life? And they really don't know. And I say, your calling is to be a light unto the nations. Your calling above everything else is to become the very presence of the light of God to the nations on how we love and we serve him. And I said, and if you look at all the Torah and you look at everything in the Torah, it points to the Messiah. And only in the Messiah can you truly fulfill the calling that God has placed on you as a chosen person to be a light unto the nations. And they're like, wow, 
I've never looked at it that way. Believe me, guys, I've shared this with lots of Jewish people, and I've shared it with Orthodox Jewish people. I've shared it with the lady down the road that owns the Judaica uh, here on University that's really close with us, and I was sharing this with her, and and uh, I tell you, when they when they understand that they have a greater calling than just to be Jewish or to follow the Torah or to do what the Talmud says or what the what the rabbis say, and they realize that they have a specific calling by God to bring the light to the nations, to bring the Messiah to the nations, because all of the Torah points to the Messiah. He's the goal of the Messiah. or I mean, he's the goal of the Torah. They start questioning their life, their uh, existence. They start saying, wow, wow, you mean I'm part of this bigger picture? Because most Jews say, you know, God's, God doesn't want to be bothered with me. Most Jews are going to say, he doesn't want nothing to do with me. I mean, I mean, he's too busy. You hear that from the Jewish people all the time. He's just too busy. Why would he, why would he care about me? And then that opens up a flurry of, of, of Tanakh, scriptures in the Tanakh, in the Psalms, and in the Proverbs, that God cares for each and every one of us. He's fashioned us and formed us in the womb, that he's loved, he's, you're the apple of his eye, that you're all these things, but you have a great calling in your life. And that great calling in your life is, is, to, uh, is to, uh, to be a light to the nations. Okay, uh, uh, Marcel, you guys have your hands raised. Go ahead. That's one way to start evangelizing with the Jewish people, first and foremost, is really if you start talking to them about their calling, okay, uh, you'll see that fences will break down. You'll see that walls will will, will fall down. Uh, go ahead. I mean, go ahead, Mary. Un unmute your, you got to unmute first, though. I can't unmute you. You got to do it. There you Sorry. go. Sorry. Sorry. It's not my computer. Uh, we, I, I should have waited until the very end, but we've been praying for um, uh, Susan Gaines and wondered how her surgery went. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when I talked earlier, go ahead and uh, mute yourself again because we have the echo. Um, when I talked to Peter, when I talked to Peter, he uh, he said that she went through the surgery really well. Um, she uh, he is expecting her to come home today. Haven't heard back from him yet to see whether or not she made it home. Um, but I'll probably call him after we get done here to see how things are going. Um, but she's she was doing really well and. Uh, he was arriving around 1030-ish or so at the hospital to be with her uh, and expecting to take her home. So uh, we had Jackie and, and Rabbi Barsky were there um, with them, uh, keeping in just praying and being a part of all that. So um, so we have all that. OK, so, yeah, thank you for asking. But Susan Gaines is doing really well. OK. All right. Anybody else have a question for Linda? I have a comment. OK. Um, this is something from what you said at the beginning where the kingdom of god is real and it's the people of my movement of god's movement yeah it made me think of the kingdom of god in daniel's vision of the the statue he had all these kingdoms represented and then there was a rock not formed by human hands that came and smashed the foot that was made of iron and clay right and then became a bigger kingdom than all of those other amazing kingdoms yeah and we're part of that we're part of that kingdom that movement of god when we walk out as well amen amen that's excellent that's a great prophetic word of how big the movement has gone you know, Yeshua says from the time of Yohanan the baptizer, you know, until now, the kingdom of God will suffer violence. And it says that the violent will take it by force. That that passage has been mistranslated many times over. But really what he's talking about is that it's going to burst forth in such a way like a she it's shepherd language that the kingdom of God is going to burst forth like the sheep 
wanting to get out of the pen early in the morning where the shepherd lays across the sheep pen, the gate. And when, when he stands up and gets out of the way, the sheep just run out. They just take off and are running into the pastures and running down in the stream and it's taken off and it's like they can't be stopped. They're all like piling up behind the shepherd. And then the shepherd steps to the side and they do that. That passage that you see that the kingdom of God will suffer violent and the violent will take it by force, it's it's an idiom that simply means um, that the kingdom of God is going to grow in such a way it cannot be stopped. Just like the sheep who want to break out of the pen in the morning to go to the waters and the green pastures, that the shepherd will stand, will, will lead the way but also move out of the way to allow the sheep to go forward. And so then he's their front guard and he's their rear guard, right? And so it's shepherd language that we see throughout that language. And that's really truly what it says. And then he also says, he says, the gates of Hades shall not prevail against the kahal, against the body of believers. So this term, the kingdom of God, really is the movement of Yeshua from the time of John the Baptist, Yohanan the Immerser, until now. And we are all part of that. We are all part of that. There's, there's, what is it? Um, I don't know how many, a, a, uh, two point or three point, three point two billion Christians, mostly non Jewish in today's world, not counting all the ones who went before us and died. Okay. That believe in the Messiah. The kingdom of God cannot be stopped. It's the greatest kingdom there really is. And you're part of that if you're a believer. So that's what's really awesome, right? So, so we are called to, to really, really um, uh, be a part of that kingdom. And I love what you said. We're, we are a mishpacha. We are a family that go forth and that we proclaim the good news of the kingdom of salvation or the kingdom of God and, and bring salvation. But we also heal the sick, raise the dead. Um, all those things, that's just part of what we've been given authority to do. It's just simply what you and I have been equipped to do. And, it, and, we find, and we find ourselves doing it in the marketplace more so than, than out on the streets with a bullhorn or out on the streets with a, uh, with a, a megaphone or mag, uh, Mega. a, a megaphone out there on the streets with a megaphone and standing on the corner and shouting and stuff like that. People just keep walking by. But I'll tell you, when you're out there and you're just loving on people and you're just, you know, I, you know, another way of doing it is walking in your giftings. You take a worship leader and you walk that worship leader and you put that worship leader right down on the on the walkway at Los Olas and you just start worshiping God. People start coming. They start getting attracted because you're using the gift that God's given you and you wouldn't believe it. You wouldn't believe the people that will come to just hear worship on the beach right um and so those kinds of things and so you find creative ways to share to proclaim the good news um uh, and and understand that you've been given authority and you've been commissioned to do it and we're all called to make these disciples so it's part of the process of being part of the kingdom of god it's like if you were called into amway sales and you're an amway salesperson if you start selling uh you know herbal life <laughs> products you're not really an Amway salesman. <laughs> you're Herbalife salesman, right? So the, the reality is, is, is if you're in the kingdom of God, your calling is to proclaim the good news of the kingdom because that's what you're called to do. It's just part of who we are. Okay, so be, uh, any other questions? I know that some people checked out because it's getting late and uh, I saw that Sunny already checked out. Um, but any other questions? Or... Uh, a statement or anything you want to share? All right. Well, let's close in prayer. We are praying for you guys all. Um, I love the fact that you guys are all on here tonight and hopefully you guys glean. Did you guys all glean uh, something tonight? Did you all capture some good news? Amen. Or some good, good tips and stuff like that. Don't forget the five tools of discipleship, which are now just two tools. <laughs> okay. But always carry those with you. <laughs> You will always have an opportunity if you look for it every day. I, I, and, and the best way to start ministering to Jewish people uh, more than anything else is talking to them about their calling. And what does the Torah call, call you as a Jew to do? And I'll tell you, they, they struggle with that because they have no idea. They're not told that. 
And when they find out that they're called to, to walk with God in such a way that they become a light unto the nations, it's really hard for them to understand it because they haven't seen themselves as the light of the nations. If anything, they've seen themselves as the scapegoat for all the sins of the world. And they're been thrown under the bus by the nations. Choose and somebody else. You choose somebody else. But that's part of the calling is to be that light. And it's not that when you shine God's light into the world, they don't like it. Okay. But they need to understand it's done through Yeshua. It's done through the kingdom of God. And you'll get there. You'll get to that point. And it will open up the door for them to start asking questions. And then they'll ask you. I mean, I, the last story I have real quick, and we'll close in prayer. Is when I was at, uh, when I was a member of the Jacksonville Jewish community in Jackson Hole, there was a an older man that was there, and he did his bar mitzvah like when he was eighty years old or seventy eight years old. He had never had a bar mitzvah, and I always wanted to get one. His parents were atheists and all this kind of stuff, and he had, he had he had really started walking really strongly. And this is a non uh, non messianic congregation, but he was on his dying bed, and uh, he started getting really old and. He couldn't do what he wanted to do, and he was kind of homeridden. And they were calling up people in the Jacksonville Jewish community to go visit him. And and the secretary or the executive secretary called me up and said, Aiden, would you be willing to go visit uh, David? And I said, sure, I'd be glad to go see David. I Yeah, I'd be glad to go see him. Well, I didn't know David very well, but I, I called him up and showed up at his place and visit and had some tea with him and coffee. And we were just talking. Well, this guy, I didn't think this guy knew that I was messianic. Because other people knew I was messianic, and the leaders of the of the shul of Jacksonville Jewish Community knew I'm messianic, but I didn't think David knew I was messianic. And he was sitting there with me. He goes, "Can I ask you a question, an honest question?" I said, "Sure." He says, "Do you think Jesus?" And he used Jesus. He didn't say Yeshua. He goes, "Do you think Jesus believed that he was the Messiah?" I know that we call him the, I mean, not we, he goes, I know that people call him the Messiah and people worship him as the Messiah. But do you think, believe, do you believe, do you think that Jesus himself believed he was the Messiah? And I said, absolutely. Absolutely. He goes, really? And I shared with him. He says, yeah. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So that's what Jesus said. And I said, and Jesus either had to be, a, and I used, uh, 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 what's his name? C.S. Lewis's thing, he had to either be a liar, a lunatic, or he had to be Lord. And I told him, if he, he can't just be a good rabbi. He can't just be a good Jew because of the things that he said. And I got to share with this guy this. Um, on his, pretty much he died like what, two, he died like two weeks later or something like that. But this was the dying question that he had inside of him. I mean, he could have been thinking of anything else, but the thing he wanted to know for sure above everything else is if Jesus himself believed he was the Messiah. I said, absolutely. And when I said it without, without a, without a, uh, well, um, you know, some people, I said it without a lack of any conviction whatsoever. I was completely convicted in saying that Yeshua absolutely believed that he was the Messiah. And when I said that, that was enough for him. That's what he needed to hear. And I expect to see him uh, in heaven, in heaven, because he was already pondering those questions and doing that. I wish I could have led him in 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 prayer and and led him to the Lord right there and then. It just the opportunity didn't seem right for me to do it. Maybe I missed an opportunity and I repented of that later. Whether I did or not, I'll never know. But the thing is, is that I believe that we will see him because he already had those questions pondering in his heart. So I just want to encourage you guys. Sometimes you may say one word and you don't think that that was enough. You never think it's enough. But that one word is all they needed to hear. All that, that, those two words that that young lady, all she needed to hear was that I, you tell her that I see her and that I love her. And that's all she needed to hear. Okay. So Lord, I just thank you for this evening. Thank you for the people that are here tonight. I, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you will give courage and strength and the ability to to really share the good news of the kingdom of God with the, those that they work with and those that they come across in the marketplace, Lord. Let every single person on here, even though they may not be called to be an evangelist, they're called or commissioned to share the gospel and to make disciples along the way as they go, Lord, as they go about their day, as they go about their life. And so, Lord, I just pray that you give them courage and strength and joy to share of the good news of the kingdom 
so that others may be partake in what was freely given to us so that we can freely give. We give you glory and praise in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. That was a good time. We had a lot of fun. I hope you guys enjoyed it. You guys were real quiet, but I think it's because you were learning something, maybe. <laughs> oh, Rabbi. So we've gathered to worship here in the house of the risen sun.